he sent a letter from the Holy Land, from the area around Jerusalem, over to Babylon, which is hundreds of miles away. Now, in the time of Jeremiah, those messages did not pass with the quickness of an email or a, a text message. It took weeks, probably, for the letter even to get there. Things were a lot slower then. And maybe that's something about ourselves that we have to look at. That God works with us slowly, inch by inch, step by step. We, as Americans, children of a technological age, and I know a lot of us who are a little further on in the scale of the ages, uh, wants to say, we're not technological, you know, I don't play with my cell phone all the time and all that. Oh, yes, you are. When's the last time you turned on the light switch? Or radio or television? You are as much, no matter how old you are today, you are as much a child of our technological age as the grade schooler who is busy texting uh, the other side of the church, saying, what are you talking about? God works slowly, in fact, so slowly, he sent the people into exile, sent his own people, Israel, into exile, so the scriptures say, and that he was going to rescue them. As God always does. But it would take 70 years. What that really means is that the people who were reading Jeremiah's letter probably wouldn't be around when the promise was fulfilled. The people didn't live all that long. So they were told, build houses, plant vineyards, plant gardens. In other words, live your life looking for me. And you, you y'all, y'all, your people will be delivered, but you may not see the day. What that really begins to put into our minds and our hearts is the fact that our salvation, Jesus' mission among us, is not just for me, but it's for y'all. It's for the world. And yes, God has a plan, but it's not an individual 57 plans for 57 different people who might gather on any, any given Sunday morning in this church. And it's certainly not a hundred thousand plans for a hundred thousand different people. It is one plan, but all of us are part of that. In a lot of ways, I find that very liberating. Most people would say, well, that, that, that takes a personal relationship away from me and God. God is a plan for my life. Now it makes it more personal, and it, it's very relieving the salvation of the world, and in fact, my own salvation doesn't rest on my shoulders. That's God's work and God's good time. As long as I'm striving to be close to God in all things, building my house, planting my vineyard, doing what I do in the place where I am, that God's plan will work itself out. That's the promise. God's plan will work itself out. Otherwise, we have a God that a lot of people can't understand and understand. How many times we have heard someone say, when something wonderful happened to them, all oh, I'm so grateful to God because look what he did for me. What if that person, that person lives a life that isn't so happy? Is it God's plan that someone is homeless or hungry? Is it God's plan that someone's body is riddled with disease? Is it God's plan that someone dies before their time or even in their time? Is it God's plan to make us miserable? 
when many of us are. Isn't God's plan that we are possessed of a negative way of thinking or an obstinance as we see in our own culture and our government? Is that all God's plan? I don't think so. All of that stuff is there. It's how we live in it and how we live through it that it is the place where we meet God. No, it's too easy to ask for prosperity to make that mistake. And the Pharisees made it, and Jesus condemned it. Jesus condemned it himself. If you think you are prosperous because you are right with God, think again. It is easier for a rich man, for a camel rather, to pass through the needle's eye than for someone who is wealthy and loves their wealth to get into the kingdom. How many times in Luke's gospel we've heard parables in these last weeks here in church about that very fact? And it is not being wealthy that's an issue. It's what we do with it and how we appropriate it. It's how we live it and how we live with it and how we live without it. How we live with good health and happiness and good fortune and how we live when those things are not part of our life at any given moment in our life. Now, God didn't have this great blueprint. I think that is a dangerous understanding. Rather, God wills, and this is where he's clear. He never says, I plan for you, James Smith. Never it's for you. He never comes in. Or you don't. God, you're getting that in. Sorry. He does say, I have plans for y'all. And we, James, Bush, Tony, Michelle, Judy, John, Ella, Rachel. We are part of God. And in that sense, that's what God has to do. What that tells us is that we cannot afford to be lone rangers we cannot go it alone. In fact, who in God's green earth would want to go it alone? It's why he gathers us together. It's why he puts us in relationship with one another. So that in our weakness, in our sadness, in our disconsolate way of living, that sometimes someone else in their joy, their peace, and their love can be there for us to support us and lift us up. So when Jeremiah is writing to the people in exile in Babylon, he's saying to them, don't be so concerned about getting back here. Live one day at a time, but live it in the Lord. And in time, God's plan for y'all will be fulfilled. And indeed, the testament of history is just So when God promises to you and to me eternal life, he doesn't necessarily promise it to me and to you individually. He does promise it to you all. He promises it to us. And so it becomes incumbent upon us to gather, to express our gratitude to God, and to love one another as he has 